Everybody got that? It's in the lower left-hand corner of your Zoom box. You'll see a stop video and a mute. If you'll just click on both of those. Also, please be sure that you're in speaker view, not gallery view. And that control is in the upper right-hand side of your Zoom box. When Kim comes on at the end, we'll ask everyone to turn their mics and their video cameras back on again so that we can all give Suzanne a round of applause and share our sparkling faces with her. We also hope to have time for Q&A at the end of the reading. You can post any questions you have for Suzanne in the chat box, which is the little cartoon bubble at the bottom of your Zoom box right in the middle. And in the chat box, you will also find a link for purchasing Suzanne's book, if you haven't already. A quick note on how you can purchase Suzanne's book, as well as other books, including your holiday shopping. Broadway Books is now open for shopping by appointment, and starting next week, we'll be adding walk-in shopping as well as space allows. I guess by now, we've all gotten accustomed to standing in line to enter stores. Customers and employees in the store are required to wear masks over the nose and mouth and to use hand sanitizer, and we are sanitizing surfaces frequently. Recently, we also added an air purifying system in the store. The health and safety of our bookstore family customers and staff is a top priority for us. You can also purchase books online or over the phone and you can have them shipped or you can pick them up during our curbside pickup hours. You will find all the pertinent times for pickup and appointments on the homepage of our website. On the homepage, you will also find links to many lists of wonderful books for browsing, including staff picks, award winners, and new and best-selling books by genre, including forthcoming books. As always, we are happy to gift wrap for free any purchases at our store. We are, I must admit, somewhat worried about the pandemic holiday situation. Usually we only have the weather to worry about during the holidays, but this year we have the weather and pandemic related issues keeping us awake at night. We are committed to making it as easy and safe as possible for you to shop here, but please, please, please get your orders in as early as possible. We are sincerely grateful to everyone who has continued to shop at Broadway Books during these challenging times, enabling us to stay open and to keep all of our staff on payroll. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And now let's get started. Suzanne Sigafus is a mid-century child of the Midwest who spent time living in New York City and San Francisco before finding Portland, which she loves. She and her husband live in a 1916 house they restored in 1999, where they are gratefully sheltering in place among graceful trees and stalwart neighbors. Her work has appeared in The Oregonian, Windfall, and Voice Catcher, among other publications. Her lyric essay, Green, published in Bellingham Reviews, issue 71, received a Pushcart nomination. Suzanne's chapbook of poems, Held in the Weave, was published by Finishing Line Press in 2011, and we had the pleasure of hosting her book launch at Broadway Books, actually inside the store. That was a fun night. Her new full-length collection of poems, The Swarm of Light, which you'll see briefly, and then it'll disappear because of my weird screen, um, has just been published by iBeam Books, and it is a beauty. So please join me in welcoming Suzanne Sigafus reading from This Swarm of Light. Hello, hello everyone. Hello. 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 Okay, why aren't I popping up on the screen? Am I? You're, you're there and we you can hear you. Us. Oh, I don't see myself. How interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, but you're there and we can hear you and we can see you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. And you, you look know? fabulous. Oh, <laughs> thanks. I'd like to see myself a little larger. Hmm. Well, hi, I'm sorry, that's, <clears throat> that was awkward, but um, the moment has arrived. My book, my full length, <laughs> my full length collections of poems is out in the world. 
um, I, I am amazed. So I just want to share with you all that um, two weeks ago today, I turned 73. And uh, about six weeks before that, this book came out into the world. And um, I am officially naming myself a very happy late bloomer. Now, I get pushback on the late bloomer <laughs> because people don't want to think about the late part, but it's actually a very joyful expression for me because I had given up on my creativity for several decades. And when I turned 50, I just was grabbed by poetry and I grabbed back and it's been the most amazing journey and it's made my life so rich and it's made me feel good and feel so much and I'm so grateful for it. So poster child, that's me, late bloomer. Yay, we can do this. It's never too late. That's the other way of putting it. I think I would like to read a couple of poems to you just right off the bat um, from the first section of my book. And then I'll talk about the book a little bit. This is, I had, I had the wonderful exper experience of having my friend Lawrence Carr review my book. Um, and <clears throat> he wrote about how the, um, sorry, the first poem, the poems in the first section by their titles may appear to be nature poems and they, they are, but um, the way I do things, um, nature is the trigger, it is the impulse, it is the mirror, it is the basis on which I can then explore human experience. So my nature poems are like that. And here's the first one. Learning beauty, an apology to conifers. Schooled in the bare branch, pink blossom, ripe cherry, falling leaf dow of deciduous, I could not love you, spruce and cedar, thick against the hills, nor you, pines and firs, sentinels of the interstate. I drove fast and north, then fast and south, dissing you as same old same. I'm sorry. I am not that person now. I live among you, with you, breathing air fresh praised with pine and in your thrall. You loved me when I was lost. Love me now with ever constant green, your way of stillness, willing to direct my eyes every time to the sky. Cooper's Hawk Alone with sad news Here's my box of tissues There, a cup, a pen Ghostly rings mark the table Daily I get lost in headlines, then a crossword grid. I set my coffee down, careless, no coaster. And there it is, another insult to the varnish. Last week, a great blue heron fell, sorry, let me start that again. Last week, a great blue heron flew so close I felt the whoosh. Yesterday in Texas, my old friend Morris fell and died. 
Today, a cooper's hawk lands high up in the neighbor's birch. I study the hawk, review today's sad news, and cry. The raptor stares unblinking. Disciplined at his art, wait, stares is wrong. The hawk watches me like a hawk. Are city raptors wise to window glass, to barriers unseen? Grief struck, I am easy prey. Please, not me, not today. The hawk watches. I reread Sally's email. Morris died yesterday. I just heard. I read it once more. Then again, I look up at the branch. He's gone. Excuse me while I pick up the book I dropped. Here it is, this swarm of light, poems, Suzanne Sigafus, with three incredibly beautiful endorsements on the back that made me cry when I saw them. I have so much gratitude in my heart <laughs> to have this book in the world and my work in the world. It's just amazing. And to be, and hello, thank you, Broadway Books. I mean, yes, Sally just told you before, in 2011, I was in their lovely space, so excited out of my brain about getting my chapbook out, held in the weave, it's called, and reading and having all the, I took out my camera and took pictures of the audience. I can't do that today, can I? But the what a hidden gift of this form of virtual launch because I have family and friends on the East Coast throughout the Midwest, all the way down the West Coast tuning in. I have my family in Canada. I have family in Ireland. Talk about staying up late. So this is like incredibly rich and surprising, right? So I celebrate this and thank you Broadway Books from the bottom of my heart for, you know, this is my first virtual launch and yours too. I mean, we're really, we're really making news together today. So thank you so much. Um, this book is so beautiful to me. People have been writing to me about receiving it and opening it and looking at it. They love holding it. And so do I. It has a beautiful soft finish. And of course, there's this fabric imagery in the photograph, which it just sort of goes together, really like connects with soft fabric and the soft feeling of the, of the paper. And then so the outer beauty, I must thank the book designer Elaine Giraud for. She put this book together with such patience with me, such love for the project and her incredible exquisite skills I remember the day she showed me this picture of the endorsements on this beautiful light overlay, which you can actually see <laughs> the pattern through. It's just, to me, it's just breathtakingly lovely. And um, I love the front cover too. And she and I worked so closely on this. Well, first of all, French flaps, pretty amazing, quite luxurious. And I have a little excerpt here on the front flap. And Elaine and I, I had typed it out. I wanted it to look like a dance, a moving line. And I sort of typed it out on the computer and she placed the type on this flap in such a beautiful way. I'll read it to you. It's an excerpt from a poem, the poem Horizon. Who taught me keep your distance? That was you, Horizon. You move away each time I step in your 
direction. So it's a little curving dance on the flap. And I'm so excited because I think it really introduces my voice to the reader right away. And I, I really appreciate that so much. Um, the inner beauty of the book. Well, I have to take some of the credit. Everybody says my poems are beautiful. And I appreciate that so much. Um, but the layout, the design of each page, I thank Dirk Stratton, my editor and publisher at iBeam Book. Dirk took my manuscript and he put it in an order and revealed things about my work to me that I'd never seen before, really. Um, there are resonances, there are mirrorings, and there's a heart to the book, which I'll talk about more when I read from that part of the book. And I, he was engaged with me. He worked with me. He challenged me to rewrite two poems, thinking there was more there than I had put on the page. And he was right. And I, I took the challenge. <laughs> and I, like, I love the poems more now because he pushed me a little bit. And then he just encouraged me too. He was wonderful. So thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I, I'm just, I'm just thrilled with it. So let's see. How about that? 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 No. Um, how about talking about the heart of the book? I have uh, the heart of the book is heartfelt. Um, this is where I, um, well, I will just tell you that a lot of the poems are autobiographical. I have no problem with you, with anyone knowing that. But for the sake of my uh, composure, I'm going to talk about this first poem and give you a little background for it. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the mother and the daughter so that I um, can keep it together. <laughs> Uh, Uncharted Terrain is um, probably the first poem in a sequence of poems about my mother's illness with cancer and her death. It is also a poem about a very extreme situation when a mother is dying and a daughter is recuperating from spine surgery and is at home with the mother under the same roof. The daughter growing stronger every day, the mother losing her strength every day. It was an incredibly extreme dynamic for a family. What wasn't just us, obviously. <laughs> I have my siblings and my father were involved, but I can only write from my point of view, and that was as the person getting stronger, especially after the first six weeks of healing from my surgery, I was able and more able and more able to help take care of her until I, I could do almost everything for her. Um, and this was one of the first poems I wrote to begin to really honor, respect, and reveal that very difficult time for us. Um, but I feel like it, it's a real act of love to share it because we all have to share such things with each other, I think. Um, so I'm a, I will read <clears throat> two poems from that, from the heart of the book. And come to think of it, I wanted to say that the book has a heart and wings. That's how I feel like um, the book flows together. The first and third sections kind of stretch out in a, in a way that's really quite grand and the heart is in the middle where it should be. Okay. Uncharted terrain. One roof shared, floor plan as landscape. 
vast plains, storm clouds, denizens dug in. One of her daughters, I'm strong again and able. Mother, lighter, smaller, has no strength. Her bad days longer by a mile, no, by a tundra. Winter put down roots so deep they choked the future. Grass, lilacs, roses, gone. Paint store colors, gone from memory. Soup steaming on the tray the day I tell her, mother, I'm afraid I'll die alone. Nine syllables fly off fitful into walls against the ceiling. Plain talk is not our custom. Winter muted, snow on shingles, frost on windows. Before she sets the soup spoon down, before she naps, she tells me, you won't die alone. I don't sleep much. One ear listens for her cries. I cross the hallway to her room, leaves of grass in hand to read aloud, or I hear her stories, secrets, jokes. Post nightmare, all we want is peace. I sit with her, doze or talk, recalling fields of tall grass, how it ripples like the sea. Or I say, heart-shaped leaf, and she says, red bud. I offer her a valerian. If sleep's a thing that can't be found, I hold the atlas open to the pages she prefers. Maps of oceans, maps of plains. Oh boy, this, um, that last poem was set in January and this one is set in April. Break. You need a break from caregiving. Everyone seemed to agree and said I looked tired. I called Johnny in New York. Yes, please come, he says. I'll throw a dinner party at Amos's new place. It's huge. I'll invite everybody. Will I tell these friends about my routine these days that I know how to bathe my bedridden mother? Towels underneath her, hot, hot water in the basin, the cloth wrung dry, no draft, no chill. If I go to Manhattan, will they call me darling? I get a plane ticket. In New York, I check into my room. I rest up, bathe, change, and hail a cab. At Amos's building, his door opens into an entry hall as big as Ohio. I walk into the embrace of friends. We make our way to the dining room, the table set for 20, linens, candles, glasses with stems. We sit down to seafood bisque, to Sally's story about that day's rehearsal. Then roast chicken, glazed carrots, peas, Billy's story about the gallery owner flirting. Salad, cheese, then Amos recites Gilbert and Sullivan. Laughter, poached pears, sweet cream. We stay up late. The next morning, my sister phones. It's over. She died last night around 10 p.m. I want this poem to linger at the party, the table, this small city of candles, 
these friends, their faces shining. I fold, then refold a soft linen napkin. I hang on to it. I'm going to move on to the third section now. I read something to you from the, <laughs> well, I hope <laughs> many of you will, will be able to see this book and read it. I, um, I, here I go back to talking about Dirk Stratton again. Um, as you all probably know, at the end of the book, there's notes from the poet, there's dedications, possibly there's acknowledgements about where it's been published before if a poem has been. And um, I sort of went wild <laughs> writing these. <clears throat> and I wrote to Dirk at one point saying, I don't know if I'm acknowledging, thanking, uh, dedicating or what else? I, I just, I, I, I was just in a blur of gratitude and reaching out. And he said, write all you want, I will make it work. And he sort of created a hybrid form for me where everything can be organized and together. <laughs> um, so, and I, I ended up writing some thoughts about the poems um, and about the poems in this last section. I said, I set out to write ekphrastic poems responding to the artworks of others. Poems have lives of their own. They have free will, hence the zigs and zags of relationship with self and with others, the zigzags mixed into my love of art. So what a wonderful experience to write a book and then write this, these notes at the end and learn something more about <laughs> what you've been doing. So, and I appreciate his help with that so much. I just, the, the back notes are just like kind of a bonus for me. I had no idea they would be that much fun or that kind of, um, or as educational to do. Oh, so I have show and tell for this one, right. Andrew Wyeth is a controversial artist, I know. He is and he isn't. I mean, he's kind of very staid American artist, but um, this is a, a painting called Christina's World. I wonder if this will work. Uh, it's, I'm real familiar with it, but I know everyone might not be. Christina's World, I hope you can see it. The woman in the foreground, the field and the mown grass and the farmhouse and barn. Um, this was painted in 1948, a year after I was born. Um, when in my small town, Ohio upbringing, I didn't see, I, I went to the library and had a wonderful time with books there starting about age seven. And I think that's when either I saw this painting at the library or perhaps it was in Time Magazine, which was our Hmm, was that weekly or monthly? I don't remember now, which is this blast of news from the bigger world for a small town gal, child. Um, and that the, the painting, I feel like I've known it all my life. It has been maligned. It has been satirized. But for me, it never moved off the, on the meter of sublimity to ordinary. It never moved off sublime for me. It looks, I know it's New England, but it looks like Ohio. The woman is so intriguing. Her body looks like a landscape. The landscape so often looks like a body. There's all that duality, which I love so much. And it's just so poignant. This And the history of this woman in the in the painting is that she had a disability that made her immobile, yet she 
would go out into the fields and well, she, basically she was crawling or pulling herself around on the ground. And Wyeth, her neighbor was so struck by that, that he wanted to salute her courage and the way that she, the, that she demanded to have this part of her life still available to her. Um, and I, I know it's controversial, but for me, it's a very, very dear and, and long time lifelong love of mine. And here is the poem uh, based on Christina's World by Andrew Wyeth, 1948. Woman, distance, house. It's startling to find her on the ground dressed for needlework or reading in the parlor. Her frock is fitted, made of ordinary cloth, yet cloth that gleams. A narrow belt, those humble shoes. Turned away from us, arms braced, she lifts her head and shoulders. Is she looking at the curves that shape the farmhouse lawn or are her eyes closed tight in prayer, in pain? If someone asks, she might say, oh, my feet and calves went numb. The earth rose up to meet me, then it held me. Bees in clover thrum and gather as she makes up names for grasses. Starling whistle, thistle down, long fescue, brother tall. She names anthills, names the furrows, calculates how far the house, how near the house, her thirst, her hope that someone's home. Did you time me? Oh, um, this will be my final poem. And we can move on and, and think about questions, comments. Um, and oh, I wanted to tell you that this might in the on the dedication page of my book. It is dedicated to the loves of my life and the lives of my love. So the lives of my love, sorry, I, I got distracted. <laughs> the To the loves of my life and the lives of my loves. And I'll tell you what, if you're here today at this launch, you are, you probably already are a love of my life, but even if I haven't met you, you are now a love of my life. There. You are, we all are, we're in this together. My, my last poem is bracingly autobiographical and it is about my life as a young woman seeking to be an actor in New York and lasting about two and a half years, almost three, and then leaving without really having made much um, progress at all and feeling pretty bad. <laughs> um, that's an old story. A lot of people can't really get into the biz, but I have friends who did, who I love to death and they're still there doing it or they've retired. And it's, I admire them with all my heart. Um, luckily for me, as you know, I, I just am now celebrating this wonderful new writerly life. So I'm back in a new way and I couldn't be happier. <laughs> um, okay, so this poem is called, this is actually in the book at the very end of the first section. 
and it's called Westward. Seeking work in New York theater, I wore a game face, found a purposeful stride, lied to the temp agency. I'm ill, or Auntie Mim has died and stood in audition lines. I walked on stage. Yes, read that monologue, or no, too tall, next. New York giveth, New York taketh away. My only savings plan was sleep. Seasons stained the weeks, and in year three, some days whispered they would never end. Thin blue hands, don't let me disappear. Brain, conjure a bay, embraced by hills, the scent of eucalyptus. I tore myself away from what I thought I knew. I traveled through the saga of plains, 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 learned all the shades of distant, of close. At last, the coast, horizon does not hesitate, wades into what is vast and restless, ebb tide, undertow, rip tide, neap tide, endless revisions. There's the edge. No, it's over here. No, it's there. Traveler, fold your tattered map. You can stop, stop here. Thank you. Okay, I just can't wait. Suzanne, that was so wonderful. I really feel like we ought to encourage everyone to turn on their cameras and unmute themselves and you deserve a round of applause. You've been speaking to a screen for the Yay. last Oh, thank you. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you for being here. That was great, Suze. Thank you. Fabulous. <laughs> Um, we have had a couple of questions come from the audience, and I'd love to share a couple of them. And then I've got a question, couple of questions too. Okay. I encourage you all to remute yourself unless you have a question you'd like to ask. And then I believe there's a raise your hand feature, but I'm I can't find it on mine. So um, maybe there's a way we can. If you if you feel comfortable typing it into the chat, that would be great, and you can send it to me, Kim Bissell, um, personally. Um, that way we'll all be able to hear Suzanne when she's talking. Um, and that was just wonderful. What a wonderful, thank you again so much, Suzanne. We're so thrilled to actually, this is our first reading and we feel I've, I'm just completely moved. So now I feel like we have to do these a lot. Um, the first question that has come in from the audience, Suzanne, is uh, what has given you your courage to express your own voice? Um, has this been a lifelong process or has it always been easy for you to express yourself? And again, if everyone will mute themselves, that would be great. Oh, boy. No, it has not always been easy. Um, let's see, how can I make this succinct? The poem you just heard about the theater is key in this because I felt like I had been divorced by an entire metropolis and I fled the city with uh, my tail beneath my, or whatever, you know, that on the thing <laughs> about the tail. I, I was not, I was not in a good place and I didn't feel good about myself. And, you know, I went on to have, I found work in offices. I sort of gave up on my creativity. I think I spent two and a half decades thinking I was not a creative person or it was too painful to be a creative person. It was too difficult to live being one. It was too hard to make a living at it. The whole long list. And I feel so amazed and it's a little mystifying that on my 50, when I turned 50, so many things changed. Poetry called out to me and I, I just, I was so ready to go back into some work that would let me be 
myself and creative that um, I grabbed back and I was in San Francisco at the time. We moved, Robert, and I'm looking at Robert. We moved up here to Portland and I thought, will I find community? Will I find people to study with and work with? And I've found all of that and more and more. It's just been amazing. Um, I think Portland is the house of yes for me. <laughs> so I have, I've gone to workshop after workshop. I've gone to retreats once in a while. I have two groups every month. I work, I work with one as a critique group. One is a get together and write group. Um, I've just never let go of it. And it, you know, this book has proved to me that if you practice, <laughs> if you practice, you'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just thrilled. I, I think I'm a stronger writer and I hope to get stronger as I, as I proceed. Let's see, did I answer the question? <laughs> I hope I think so. you did. I've got, I've got another one for you anyway, oh, Suzanne. Okay. Um, I'll try it. So this one's my question actually, and that is it, you know, it's taken a while for this book to come to fruition for you. And I wonder how you see, you were just touching on that a little bit, but how do you see your work changing over time. And you've got a couple of poems. Um, your acknowledgments and notes are beautiful and one of the funnest things to read. So that's a that's a gem. I love seeing that. Um, some of your poems are really new and things that have had that have be, um, maybe some of your feelings that have come from this last eight months, which you know the elephant in the room, our lives have changed a lot. And how how do you see how do you see the the, the breadth of time that you've been working on all of this work, how do you see how this is, how has your work changed and how, how is this time now really affecting your work? Okay. When I began in, so 22, 23 years ago, I began studying and working. Um, I was copying other, I was copying other poets. I didn't know how to, you know, I've got to say, my my sister-in-law Rosemary once said, um, "Well, poetry is just another way of talking," and that was that was really really important to me because um, and we were just talking the other week in a in a group I was in about finding your own voice. It is the cadence. It's the word choice. It's what you want to say. It's how you are moved. I don't know. I just kept trying to journey towards something that was authentic to me. And um, I'm closer now. I don't know. I don't know if I'll get closer to anything than I hope I do. But um, so Kim, so to know your own voice, the rhythm, your own nouns, your own hmm, phrases, your values, um, your, oh gosh, I don't know. You know, this is really hard to break down for me. Um, but okay, I've got a concrete, I've got a little concrete news for you. Now I remember when I was putting my um, chat book together. So I would have been working that in, up on that in about 2008 and then it got published in 2011. So I went back to all my files, to all my, all the stuff I'd written in workshops and I read everything and it was somewhat nauseating because a lot of it was really bad. And so 99, 2000, 2001, pretty bad, pretty bad, pretty bad. 2002, 2003, but in 2004, something happened. And I was like, oh, there I am. That's me on the page. That's my voice on the page. And I wish, you know, I should, I could have like looked and tried to find that particular poem where, but I don't know if it would mean anything to anybody else but me. It was just like, that sounds like me. And um, we want to see ourselves, you know, we want to see ourselves in our work. So I got closer to that at that point, And I've been trying to build on that ever since. I've been trying to be braver about saying what I feel and what happened. And, um, oh boy, I don't know. It's just that, that that moment in 2004 was just mind blowing to me. And I think 
that gave me a start on building on what I could do with language. Well, you're your own worst critic because everybody else thinks this book is fantastic. And we think oh, no. you found your voice, Suzanne. Oh, it's lovely oh, and wonderful. So. Oh, I, I feel really wonderful. I feel really happy about this book, but I think I can keep getting better. That's all. I hope. One of the, your audience members has always thought of you as a poet, um, but didn't know that you wrote essays as well. Um, so how, talk to us a little bit about how that came about um, and the differences in your preferences um, to, about essay writing versus poetry writing. Okay. Hmm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have, okay, let's see. It's true that I had, well, uh, let me just talk to you about the genesis of that. Uh, it's entirely attributable to the wonderful teacher, Andrea Hollander. And I had studied with Andrea, probably taken three or four workshops with her when she announced that she was going to, to teach a lyric essay workshop. And I didn't even know what a lyric essay was. And I always thought that essays were terrifying. Um, Um, but I was just so interested in working with her that I took the class and these examples she gave us excited me because, um, of course, in poetry, we're always compressing and it felt to me like it would be a chance to gallop as a writer, to not do a poem, but to write an essay, to cover more ground. So yeah, my lyric essay, whew, um, I had incredible beginner's luck with that. I sent it out to four places and Bellingham Review took it. And I mean, that's a very beloved place and, and it's hard to get into and there I was in it. So of course that kind of paralyzed me into not writing any more essays for a while because it was just kind of scary. It was almost scary that I got in. Um, but last fall I took a, it's, you know, this essay thing is also called memoir. It's also called creative nonfiction. It's all kind of, uh, there's a lot of tentacles to it. And I studied creative nonfiction at the attic last fall. And now that this book is out, I'm raring to go on some more essays. So I don't have a lot of news for you and I can't really compare them because I haven't um, developed that as much as I would like to. But I think now is the time. So stay tuned. I, I, don't, I don't have a lot more news right now on that. Um, I want to take an opportunity if anyone out there would like to ask you, would like to unmute themselves and ask you a question. And if not, I've got one more last question for you. So, is anyone out there would like to unmute themselves? And oh, here we go. Oh, my goodness. Can you read one more poem, Suzanne? <laughs> oh, gosh, John. That would be, I would, I would entertain that notion. I was looking at Bodhisattva. Oh. That's a beautiful poem, but choose one of your own. Two. No, no, I would, I would love to do to read the poem that you want to hear. No, I'm looking it up. It's on page forty-eight. Right on forty-eight, I've got it. So everyone, this is a dear friend and teacher, John Brem, who's he's the first endorser, endorsement writer. I just, I just don't like the word blurb on the back. And what he says is so beautiful, absolutely made me weep. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Bodhisattva. Give me the hours and miles that lie ahead and please respite from jealousies, how swift they are and terrible. Lead me to the river where the Bodhisattva rises daily to walk her miles, her hours. As the sky waves the sun down, I press my hands together at my heart. How calm they look, how still. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for asking to hear it.
Um, we have one, two more requests for poems. One from Sally, actually. She's got a poem she would like you to read. That's on page 53, if by oh, real. And then actually Dirk Stratton would love to read one of your poems as well. He'd love to read it. So maybe oh he'll do the one for Sally and then uh, we can have Dirk read one as well. Oh my gosh, that would be fantastic. Oh my gosh, so who, who wanted to hear the one on 53? Who asked for that? Sally, our dear Sally. Oh my, Sally. Oh my gosh, okay. Hmm. If by real. If by real, you mean actual. If by actual, you mean a paper cut or a twitch under the eye. If by quiet, I mean shamed, then yes, I go quiet when your sentence begins with actually. And if by silence, I mean anger, things unsaid, better left, best with the lid on. And if by contained, I mean hiding, it should be clear. It is, isn't it clear? Hiding means wanting to be seen. Um, let's invite let's invite Dirk. Dirk, why don't you unmute yourself and join us um, to read the poem that you'd like to read? Oh, wonderful. Hmm, maybe we've lost Dirk. Well, I am no. muted. I have to unmute my mic. <laughs> there he is. Here I am. Hello, Suzanne. Hello, Dirk. I've cracked the bottle of champagne for your book launch. I've got one downstairs, honey. <laughs> um, I wanted to read this poem because while Suzanne mentioned that so many of her poems are autobiographical and therefore had sort of a personal voice behind them, um, there are other poems that anyone could read like myself. And this is one of my particular favorites, <clears throat> The Inkbrush Artist. After conjuring a landscape, a brush needs a rest. The artist's eyes, they too need to look away from darkness, from light, from the horizon. Swirling her brush in the rinse pot, she shapes the bristles to a point, leans the brush on a chopstick rest. Her day's work, a pine branch so fine in detail, it is nearly fragrant. And in the distance, waterfall and mountain. The weary artist wants fire, kettle, cup, and chair. Tea steeps and steams. The branch and waterfall settle and dry. The artist puts her feet up, sips her tea. These landscapes of mine, she says to herself and to the air, every painting lately, the mountain, is farther and farther away. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Dirk. Oh my gosh, that was thrilling. <laughs> what a treat, that was a real treat. Um, so I have one last question for you, Suzanne, and that is, can you tell us more of the story about this quilt on the cover? Um, if the, was this your picture? This is, so you had talked a little bit about it, but if you could tell us a little bit more about it, that would be great. Sure. Um, I uh, attended a show at the Japanese Garden in 2011, and it was about traditional. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. can, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I get I get a little rattled about <laughs> being being unmuted. Um, yeah, I took I, I went to the Japanese Garden. There was a wonderful show about traditional tra Japanese fabrics, and I learned that day that they don't call this denim, they call it dye, indigo dyed cotton. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and indigo dyed cotton was used as clothing for not the wealthy people in Japan, but for the workers, basically, for the farmers, for I, you know, I, you get the picture, I think. But they patched and repatched these, these surfaces. And also we saw futon. This is a futon cover that I took the picture of. And um, pause button to praise my uh, dear neighbor, Majuro. Um, he looked at some of my photographs and saw that the, I, I don't know how to, how to look at photographs the way he does. He found that the digital digits per inch and the resolution and the, and the size would be almost ideal for a book cover. And then, and there we were, we just went to town and I just, I don't know. I just, I just think it's incredibly lovely. And I'm so surprised that, um, well, I looked and looked on Shutterstock and all these other things, but it just wasn't, I wasn't, it was like going into a giant department store and you just know there's nothing here for me. So <laughs> I went to my film roll and went back and back in time and found this. So hooray. It's literally the most perfect way to wrap your beautiful, beautiful book. So <laughs> excellent choice. Excellent choice. Oh, that's, that's so sweet. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, we've had a wonderful, wonderful time tonight. Um, we're rounding on an hour, and I know after a while everyone gets a little tired of being on their screens, but I think we should all open ourselves up for one more giant round of applause for you because you should change us to gallery view so you can see all the people that are still here. Um, and a uh, big, huge round of applause. <laughs> so oh, I love it. oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Susie, we love you. We love you from New York City. We love you. <laughs> Wonderful reading, Suzanne. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect, Suzanne. Thank you, Suze. Well done for managing the the screen. Oh. It's not an easy thing. Yeah, well done. Great. Thank Thanks you, Rod. Wonderful. New Mexico shout out. New Mexico shout out. Yay, hey, New Mexico. New Mexico. I'm going to drink your champagne. Love you. Canada. Canada. Yay from Canada. I so appreciate you all being with me. So appreciate. So appreciate. I'm a from Doofer. I'm a Doofer. What a. What a wonderful swarm of light. Um, and so before you guys all take off, just please know that from the bottom of Broadway Books heart, we are absolutely thankful for you and all of your support. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We're holiday shopping early with the link for Suzanne's book is in the chat. You can find it on our website as well. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was a true gift. Thank, Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye. Thanks, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Love Bye. you. Bye, Susie. Bye, Susie. Oh, hey, Susie, is your cousin Timmy in New York? Is I she hear cousin? you. I hear you. Nobody else calls me Susie. Ah. <laughs> I don't want to start. We love you. Love you, too. Hi, yeah. sure. Suze. Good night. We're Suze. off to bed. Bye. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night and love to all. Good night. Good night. Brava. Brava. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Beautiful. Just like you. Oh, thank you, Penny. <laughs> Gosh. Thank you, Ellie, for all the work you did. Our tech genius, El Eloise. Of course. <laughs> yeah, this was great. So great. Thank you, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and end it now. And Suzanne, we we did we were able to record it, and so we'll figure out what to do with that at this point. And thank you, everybody. What a what a gift. This was a really lovely, lovely, lovely way to start our uh, virtual reading extravaganza. However, we make that work out. So <laughs> thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, we love you. Good night, good night. Good night, good night.